Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having a great Sunday. Look, I'm not going to take long. I know it's Sunday. I know this is family day, get together day. People have been in church all the night. Uh, but this is the first day of the weekend. Yesterday I told you we were segueing into a conversation on the disintegration of the uh, black family nucleus and the negative impact that it has had on the black collective as a whole and specifically on its impact on our children and their ability to go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and actually compete. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get into this. As you saw in the intro of this video, we are uh, in the midst of a fundraiser between our research center, which you're gonna get a lot of what that does when I read this segment from my book. but. Our research center, our think tank, our program development and implementation program, our wraparound services for mental health, domestic violence, sexual abuse, uh, and so much more. There's so much work to be done. There's so much more research to be done. Uh, we need your support. We need your support to help us expand the reach of our programs, to intensify our research efforts and problem solving capacity uh, and the expansion of the think tank. There is a lot going on. I've been in this game for 35 years. I'm not going anywhere, but I'm not getting any younger. So it means I need to really be uh, creating the path and the ability to pass this off uh, to younger generations with the work done. And so it's extremely important. So again, if you believe in the work we're doing at the Odyssey Project over the last 30 plus years, uh, look in the description box and determine which, which way you want to give and support the work we do. All right. So this week's series is going to be, um, again, coming from the chapter in my 23rd book, which is The Undoing of the African-American Mind. And it is, uh, and I, I'm going to make sure that the link is in the description box because I believe someone asked me how to get it. Um, there are a couple of ways you can get it. You can get the signed copy from me or you can get it from Barnes & Noble, Amazon, a bunch of different places. But uh, Sony Books, Kobo Books, a bunch of places. But uh, this is coming from, if I'm not mistaken, Chapter 4 that deals with the family. And the sub topic of this particular section I'm going to read, obviously I'm not going to read the entire chapter. I'm going to read just... Uh, a couple of paragraphs from the section and we're going to talk about it and what it means and why it's so important for us to get a handle on it. It's called Understanding Why the Black Family is Important to the Survival of the Black Collective. It is the breakdown of the black family that uh, that function as the conduit through which many of the most insidious and malignant ma machinations of white supremacy racism were interpolated into the natural order and function of black culture. Because the traditional black family began to disintegrate, black children were growing up in homes without the proper balance of masculine and feminine energy, subsequently resulting in black youth who lacked the totality of comprehensive development psychologically, sociologically, emotionally, and spiritually. This trauma-related condition has led to what I refer to as scar tissue of the soul. Um, the lack, uh, let me go ahead, uh, scar tissue of the skull, a little digression, scar tissue of the soul is a condition in which psychological, emotional, and physical trauma results in diminished capacity to function within the parameters of normal human engagement in the key areas of pro-social behavior, filial responsibility, and empathy. A lot of what we're seeing can be directly linked to a breakdown in family structure. Okay, so the lack of the presence of one parent, predominantly the father, leads to psychological and emotional trauma that has potential to negatively has the potential to negatively impact the child's ability to learn, adjust, engage, compete in the world, compete in the world that is inherently hostile towards them. It seems that this impacts young black males more than females. However, young black girls are far from being impervious to the nefarious forces at play. They simply manifest the negative impact differently. What should be understood is that the impact of the absence of the father figure in the home not, not exclusive, it's not exclusive to African Americans. There is an abundance of pragmatic data that reveals that the development of social, cultural, and economic changes has actually impacted all racial groups. Although African American families being the targets of a more pretentious assault has suffered at a greater level. Regardless of race, 
when the father is absent, all members of the family suffer. I don't know what's going on with this, but if you can hear me, uh, it's good. I don't know why it's doing that, but it, it does it sometimes. Additionally, the family environment is where the concept of black group economics, filial responsibility, racial socialization, and community leadership are introduced and developed. The home is where a child begins to develop their self-concept or self-image, and the parents serve as the primary label givers. It is the contemplation of young black youth on the reflected appraisals of their parents that sets the foundation of how they see themselves in the world. The inferiority, com the inferiority complexes and poor self-images that plague our community are partially the result of a monumental failure in the home. Um, so let's talk about this real briefly. We'll go back. We tend to see things superficially. We tend to look at everything that we engage on a superficial level. So what happens is we normally don't probe deep enough to find out how certain things impact us be below the surface. We know how it makes us feel predominantly. And we normally tend, tend to move on our feelings. We very rarely educate ourselves in the form or in a way that empowers us to actually impact the thing that we are feeling positively or negatively. And this is where a lot of our problems lie. We know that people are behaving a certain way, but we can't explain why and we haven't put enough energy, effort and time into understanding why the answers are there. The research is being done. I've done thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours of research into understanding the enigmatic issues that plague our community. Uh, nothing is more prevalent than the breakdown of the family because all of the other things that are there are predominantly connected to that breakdown. When the family structure is there, you're able to inculcate uh, self-worth, self-value, responsibility, pro-social behavior, uh, racial socialization, a sense of power, uh, of a powerful, strong, and anchored identity. So much of it comes out of that home. When the home lacks balance, masculine and feminine energy, the man is just simply equipped to do things differently and specifically, and so is the female. While we can mix in and take up slack in times, we're always going to be operating outside of our element when we do. And when you operate outside of your element, you operate outside of your optimal impact. Now, so the one thing that we must understand in this is that we are literally handicapping our children by not addressing this issue. And this isn't a call or a plead or a demand uh, for, for anyone to stay in a relationship where you are not being treated right. This isn't what this is about. Uh, the personal responsibility is always first. You always make sure that you're okay. Now, here's the, here's the difference though. How are we defining okay? Are we defining okay as in healthy environment, healthy space, are we defining okay as in the social cultural norm of am I happy because things are going my way? Now, that's a difference. My way of judging things is are the people in my periphery, I'm not just talking about relation, uh, one type of relationship, period. Are the people in my periphery pro, uh, pro me in the sense that they add something to me and am I adding to them? Is there this this dynamic of reciprocity to where I'm pouring into them, they're pouring into me, they're reaping from me, I'm reaping from them, and there's a balance, and we, we create that balance. Is it pro? Do they have my best interest at hand? Or are they there in, in, in general offering negative energy, negative insight, negative impact, negative contributions uh, and assessments and everything else? And if so, then I need to deal with that. But it's not about always being happy it's not always being right one of the books when i wrote my fourth book when your house is not home dealing primarily with conflict within the marriage and how to solve it uh i did a lot of research one of the books i read was i think it may be up here so matter of fact it is sacred marriage i got books all around uh sacred marriage written by gary thomas and on the front cover of this book that i researched it's 25 years old now uh on the front cover of this book that I researched, there's a question that Gary poses before you ever open the book, and it's, 
and the and title of it is sacred marriage. And, the, and, and on it, it says, what if God's design for marriage? What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? Now, first of all, to really get a true understanding of that, you have to really truly gain an understanding of what holy means, because the moment that holy is mentioned now, you get this highly religious mindset of, you know, churchified and all that. No, holy speaks to the integrity of God. When you hear that, God, when God says, be holy for I am holy, what is God saying? God is saying that this is my character, the value system on which I operate. My holiness is the reflection of the fact that I've never violated my character. So then when he says, what if God designed marriage uh, to make you holy more than to make you married, uh, make you happy? What if it's the place you're going to be challenged the most, but you get the most reward? Where's the place that's going to cause you to step outside of yourself more than you've ever been to because you are literally putting someone else ahead of you? Now, this only works when both partners are doing it. See, if I'm putting her ahead of me and she's putting her ahead of me, it doesn't work. If if I'm putting me ahead of her while she's putting me ahead of herself, it doesn't work. So then what has to happen? You have to have two people who trust the intentions of one another and get in. So this isn't about being in a place that makes you miserable, but it's more than just about happiness. It's about are we building something? Do I see what's coming out of this in the future? Are we creating the proper environment for our progeny, our offspring, our children? Are we creating the best situation to uh, empower them, to give them something? And here's the thing. Uh, I talked about it. I said that this breaking away, this, 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 this dysfunction that's coming out of the breakdown of the family and the separation and not only separation but the animosity that has developed between black men and black women and I, and I say that the result of the damage being done to the children is what I refer to as scar tissue of the soul and then I define scar tissue uh, as being a condition in which psychological emotional and phys physical trauma results in a diminished capacity to function within the parameters of normal be human engagement in the key areas of pro-social behavior, filial responsibility, and empathy. And what am I saying? What I'm saying here is we now know about what? Adverse childhood experiences. Now, I wrote this long before adverse childhood experiences was made a thing. Uh, I wrote this when the research that addressed adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, as they're now known, uh, was, I mean, was in its infancy. And I was looking at the development of children in general, but then the development of black children in specific. And it was in doing this years ago that I decided when my older kids who are now in, my oldest will be 38 in a few months. Uh, when they were the kids I was rearing, those are the only three that, well, two, because my daughter then hit her. But the boys, I put my hands on them the same way that I got handle but as i started to develop this i started to learn this is not the way i'm gonna handle my children so my young kids don't have a clue what getting hit feel, feels like from a parent because that's not how i operate any longer but i had to develop but i developed this scar tissue of the skull soul thing and what it means is we know now through adverse childhood experiences these aces that they have far-reaching consequences outside of childhood, outside of just psychological disruption. There is physiological, long-reaching uh, ramifications and implications associated with childhood trauma. We know that each one of these ACEs, matter of fact, let me grab this. A couple of, uh, couple of months ago, I did a um, workshop with Harris County Sheriff's Office who has a re-entry program that's designed or suppo supposed to be designed to reduce recidivism uh, as, uh, as well as provide wraparound services for families of uh, incarcerated men predominantly. And I was consulted to gain an understanding of what that incarceration does. Having a parent incarcerated is an ace. It's an adverse childhood experience. It is one of the things that lends to poor health, uh, poor self-worth, poor self-image, uh, a lack of process, social uh, capacity, and so much more. Uh, you get four of those, and then we get off into some things. See, uh, I'm going to read, matter of fact, I'm going to read the 10 primary ACEs, and I've identified at least another 10. 
but these are the 10 primary aces that almost every study acknowledges. Um, number one, physical abuse. Number two, verbal abuse. Number three, sexual abuse. Number four, physical neglect. Number five, emotional neglect. Number six, alcohol, an alcoholic parent. Now that also extends to any type of chemical uh, dependency. An incarcerated family member. The disappearance of a parent through divorce, death, or, or abandonment. A family member diagnosed with a mental illness. Now, this doesn't have to be parents diagnosed. This is a family member diagnosed with a mental illness. A mother who is a victim of domestic violence. These are the top 10 aces. Now, you get four of these. And I have literally worked with kids with eight or nine. You get four of these. 12 times more likely to attempt suicide at some point in your life. Two and a half times more likely to develop um, uh, physiological conditions like type 2 diabetes. Uh, four times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in America. Uh, four times more likely to develop certain forms of cancer. See, we talk about cancer, we always talk about carcinogens, we talk about what's in the air, uh, what's in the food, and all of this, but what we don't realize is that 90 plus percent of all cancers are environmental, not in the sense of what you're eating or sitting on or touching, but the level of stress that you are operating in on any given day. So, literally, how you manage stress is going to determine uh, a major part of your health is uh, psycho... Uh, this is uh, psychosomatics uh, in a more in-depth uh, understanding. In other words, stress impacts genes, genetic makeup. In other words, while not interfering with DNA sequence, um, stress interferes with how uh, the sequence is interpreted. Your DNA sequence has to be interpreted by every gene, every cell in the body that know how to perform. When it's been interrupted by stress, it's hard to interpret. It's misinterpreted. Cancer. It's misinterpreted diabetes is misinterpreted stress on the arterial system arterial sclerosis all these different things that come out of this stress it, autoimmune diseases like lupus while they can be uh, a genetic makeup but it also comes from stress and it's definitely exacerbated by stress the ability for one to heal, either from physiological trauma or from mental and emotional trauma, is directly related to the amount of stress in their lives. You get a person who is positive about their outcome, positive about their diagnosis. Uh, even when doctors are, ha are grim, they make up in their mind, no, this is going to happen, I believe, I believe. Actually show that they heal at a higher rate than people who may even have better medical care. Why? There's a power in this. And what we don't understand is we're exposing our children to these high levels of stress just by not having a balanced home, first and foremost. One of the biggest uh, problems is the split splitting of parents. Having one parent not present all the time is an ace. Meanwhile, there's a cultural push to celebrate single parenthoods, especially single black women. Don't get me wrong, I have mad love, nothing but love for black women who are out there doing it. Because in many instances, you have no choice, which is why I'm sitting before you now. This is not to malign black women. This is to sit up and say, while we are asked, why you are doing it, you shouldn't be doing it. Now, there are a lot of different things that play into how we deal with this. Number one is, first and foremost, we've got to do a better job of choosing and selecting so that we don't end up in situations with people we absolutely cannot work with, live with, build with. And so we're left with no other alternative than to evacuate the relationship or suffer dire consequences. That's on the front end. The other end is we've got to get outside of ourselves. So many of us are so self-consumed and we live in a self-consumed, self-driven, individualized uh, culture that says it's about me. So when it stops being about me, when anytime I'm not okay or happy, it's your fault and I ain't staying. I'm going on to the next thing that makes me happy and I don't take time. And what happens is you'll spend your entire life jumping, leaving fractured parts of yourself in situations because you are evacuating situations prematurely but leaving part of you behind psychologically you're fractured now you're rearing kids in a fractured environment you may excel in one thing you got a lot of higher higher earning uh females out there that are single parents that are doing it killing the game when it comes to being a provider 
but it's so much more to being a man than being a provider. But we've sold on the goods. We've commodified the black man. And in commodifying the black man, the only thing we see is, does he have the bag? If he doesn't have the bag, he's not a man. But that, So even if he's protecting you, he's not a man. Even if he's providing you with an environment where you feel elevated, respected, loved, and cared for, he's not a man. He doesn't have the bag. Now, should he, be, should he be grinding for the bag? Absolutely. Should he have a vision on how he's going to get the bag? Absolutely. Because being a part of, being a man, a part of that is provision. But see, what we miss is all these other things. So when we determine, okay, uh, what decisions I have to make on whether I'm going to keep my man, it's just solely on can I replace his income. And you're missing everything else out there. Men, when you sit up and you get tired, of feeling disrespected you get tired of hearing what you don't do whatever it is that's driving you out of the house but i got another problem with men and um we are going to actually i've, I've talked with a couple of brothers i'm about to executive produce and host um a new podcast called up in smoke it's going to be different than anything i've done in the past everything with me is about positive uplift this is going to be real talk with men so you're going to hear some things and men are going to say what's on their mind and i'm going to do the best i can to mediate it and keep it and and, and translate it so women don't get too offended but i'm probably telling you men and women are going to probably get offended with this because we're going to talk about some things see we men don't have this place see everything you look you get tired of turning on your your phone and black men are sorry and trifling when 80% of us are doing, 80 plus percent of us are doing great. Yeah, that 10% to 12% doing some crazy off the wall bull crap. And that's what we're all getting judged by. That's the image presented to media. So guys, check this out though. One of the biggest problems I have is first and foremost, you got to know your role. You got to know who you are. You got to know why you're there. You got to understand the responsibility, but see that comes with proper socialization and that proper so, pro, proper socialization best happens in a two parent household. That's why I created Black Men Lead, Rite of Passage. Why? Because we have to have a replacement and an alternative for all the single parenting ho parent households out there where manhood isn't being daily modeled in the house. Dad might be present. Matter of fact, uh, statistics tell me that black men are the most present out of all fathers, including white fathers, Latino fathers, and Asian fathers. We are the most present. We spend the most time with our kids. We give. We have the most conversations with our kids, and we are more likely to give the most of our earnings to the upkeep and care of our kids. But that's never going to be put front. This is a Kaiser study. This is also a, nut, a study uh, duplicated by the Pew Research Center. It's actually published on the CDC website so this isn't something that I'm pulling out of my ass. This is literally the truth, but we won't get that because that's not the narrative they want to present to um, America and definitely not to black women. We, they, they, want, they want black women to see us, look, if he can't do this and this and this, don't even waste your time. The thing is, the way it's meant to be is you're supposed to build together. He's supposed to have a vision. You're supposed to question him about his vision when you meet him. If you can literally say, man, I see how I fit into this vision and it ties into the vision I have for my life. We're going to build. Then that's where you start. See, it's not about ease. And as uh, Gary Thomas pointed out, it's not uh, all about happiness. Happiness is an internal thing anyway. Happiness is about finding joy in the place and the position that you find yourself in because you know where you're going and you know how to create that thing. You should be 100% in control of your happiness. Now, your mate should make sure that the environment you need for you to create your happiness is present, that as much stress has been removed from your environment as possible, that they are not contributing to your stress. One of the things that I always tried to do in my situation, I always tried to remove the stress of the children as much as possible from Mary because I knew when I met her that she had been the only one. She, it was just her and, and, and just the magnitude of a woman rearing children 
by themselves. I don't think people get it. And I think black women have become so used to doing it that they just get up and do it and don't realize the strain that it's putting on them emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, physiologically, and the, 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 the impact it's having on the kids. So when I came in, my thing is, I'm going to do everything I can to be the buffer. So I'm going to intercept as much of this as I possibly can. So I become the guy that goes to the school. And in, in some instances, I become the guy that's not that popular because I'm the guy that's calling out being, because my God, how much do you expect a person to be able to take? Now, men, we have to know who we are when you're going, because I'm going to tell you something. I love my sisters, I do. But if you're not sure who you are, you're gonna question the hell out of yourself with the best black woman. And it's what she's supposed to do. If you got a woman that don't challenge you to be better, you, 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 you're you not in a good situation. You got a woman that'll sit up and say, hey, I need you to bring it. You, you, now, you should already have that in you. You should be trying to bring it, but that's some time. But see, the same woman that tells you, you I need you to bring it, the same person that tells you, hey, come on, we need you to get it together. This is going on, that's going on. Come on, come on, come on. That same person has to be the person that tells you, hey, I believe in you. No matter what, we riding this together. I know you're capable. What do you need me to do? You don't need anybody, you don't need a yes woman. You don't need anybody that's going to kiss your butt all over the place. You don't need anybody that's going to co-sign your BS and let you be out doing everything you want to do because you making money either. You need somebody that's going to sit up there and you need to look at it and say, man, I see the value in this person. I see why I wake up every day and I go hard in the paint. I see why I put it all on the line in this person. I'm not just talking about physiological. I'm not just talking about what happens in the bedroom. I'm talking about her spirit. How peaceful is the home when you open the door? Because here's what's going to happen. I could get into the relationship part all day, but here's what's going to happen. See, the marriage is the institution that serves as the foundation for the family. The family is the institution through which values and interests and principles and the capacity and the mindset to go out into the world and do supernatural things and unbelievable things and phenomenal things is done. You inculcate those ideas, those thoughts, those values, those practices, those principles into the child in the environment within the family inside of the home. The problem is when the home is broken. The mechanism is broken also. Then there's some other things. Bi uh, biological fathers, listen to me now. Listen to me. Listen to me. When the biological fa father answers the home, the chance of his daughter being sexually assaulted increases something like six or seven times. You are a protector before you are a provider. You are literally physiologically gifted to defend before you are mentally and uh, emotionally mature enough to and skilled enough to earn a living to support and provide for an entire family. You are physically able to put something on somebody's ass when they mess with what you love. That's because that's the first and foremost responsibility. And when you leave that home, you leave that baby. And it's not just females. Little boys get molested too. Little boys get abused too. That's just one thing that happens. But even in an environment where they're not being physically abused, the absence of the parent has a mag, a, 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 a mag, magnanimous, I mean, just huge, not magnanimous, but a uh, monumental, is the word I'm searching for, a monumental impact on their sociological psychological, spiritual, and emotional well-being. And it plays out into their adulthood and it carries out over the course of their life. That's what adverse childhood experience is about. It's about how their experiences as children are impacting them. First and foremost, if they're in a place where there's a lot of stress, this childhood experiences, these adverse childhood experiences are gonna impact their health through life. Then if they are in a situation where even though it's not uh, a lot of stress, 
mom and dad still aren't there, there's some things going on, they're still going to have deficiencies because we were designed to be properly socialized in the balance of masculine and feminine energy where dad does certain things well and mom does certain things well and they come together to create this ideal environment where mom is the teacher and the nurturer, dad is the model, dad is the example, dad is the source of identity, dad is the environmental environmental development and creator and, 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 and sustainer. Dad creates the environment that makes everything safe to become. If dad isn't there to make everything safe to become, mom's stress alone creates a negative environment. We can hear women say all day long, I don't need a man, but the very absence of a man creates a stress she doesn't even realize she's experiencing. There's just certain things that start to weigh on her because why? Anytime uh, you go in and you do the thing that you are designed to do, even when you're doing it at the highest level and it's intense, that's a level of comfort with it because you're in your zone. When you're doing what you do, you, you're going to be pushed, but even in the pushing, you, you, you're in your zone. No stress. Focus and intensity. Intensity and stress aren't the same. But when you get out of your zone and now you're doing something you're not built to do, frustration sets in before you know it. Now, you'll do it because if you're built like that, you're going to make sure you have to do you're going to do whatever you have to to make things happen. Black moms do it all the time. Now, I was a single father. I did it. But what I'm going to tell you is I could not replace mom. The providing part had down. The leader part and, and disciplinary part had down. But there's a softness I just didn't possess. Even when I tried to be soft. And then in moving into that space, it made me uncomfortable. Made me agitated. I had to learn what was going on so that I could manage it and that I could teach other people what was happening. When you step outside of your design to do anything, you may accomplish it, but it comes at a price. That's why the man is designed to do certain things and the woman is designed to do certain things and together they create this unbelievable team. But nobody's talking team anymore. Nobody's talking unification anymore. Nobody's talking the coming together. Everybody's talking about what I want. Now, if you want to be that person, you need to be by yourself and you don't need to procreate. Because how you carry yourself is a direct is going to be a direct impact on the children you raise. And how well prepared they are. And you're going to send them out into a world where they are self-centered, but nobody is going to buy into it. They're going to be turned off by it. They're going to push back on it. They're going to reject them because all they are thinking about is what I'm getting out of it. And then they're going to get around a bunch of other people who want to suck the life out of stuff. And then they're going to suck the life out of each other and complain about what's going on and blame everybody else. And we're going to end up with another generation of complainers that's doing nothing. We're going to have to be willing to sit up and look at what's going on and say, okay, I'm going to do something different again I'm not suggesting or, 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 or in any way saying that you should be with someone who doesn't love you doesn't respect you doesn't treat you within the highest regard what I'm gonna sit up and say is you in 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 you expecting and demanding them to treat you in the highest regard and to love you with all their being you better have somewhere in you that you can acknowledge their humanity or you're gonna have a problem unrealistic expectations are destroying relationships at an astronomical rate you better be able to understand the person that you're dealing with number one is if if you're in a traditional relationship, meaning that there's a male and there's a female, y'all don't think alike. And I don't mean just in culture. I don't mean just in what you saw growing up. I mean mentally. Your brains function differently. A man's brain moves from the uh, front to the back. He's focused on accomplishment, what he does with his hands especially, things that he can build, things that he can That's why when you tell a man your problems later, the first thing he's trying to do is solve it. Why? That's what he does. Women move left or right everything is intuition everything is about what i can feel what i can do men are visual and and when women when you when women hear men are visual all they think about is how their bodies look no men are visual everything we see we see both physically and spiritually women are what intuitive they have to intuition they feel 
They feel physically and they feel spiritually. And they operate and move off of what they feel. And it works great when that's meshed because the vision and the feeling both together, put together in, in sync, something very powerful, a synergy that is a magnificent and phenomenal force that supersedes and transcends the, in the individual gifting and power and natural um, strengths of each person as individuals. You will never accomplish as an individual what you can accomplish with a partner, period. Let, it, let, them, let them keep gassing you up. If it was capable, we would be asexual. God would have designed us to where we don't need a partner that is in many ways opposite to us. And if you got somebody that's opposite, you got to understand what their needs and their desires and their love and, and what they want. Women, you want love. You want to be able to look at your man and see what he's doing and see how he loves you. What is he giving up for you? What is he doing for you? How much attention does he speak power into your life? Or is he tearing you down? Is he giving to you and listening to you and addressing your issues? Or is he dismissing everything you say and, and, and moving on and doing whatever he wants to do despite what you're saying? Now, that doesn't mean you get to manipulate and control him and tell him what he should. He's the one with the vision. But he should be hearing you and saying what's bothering you and be in some kind of way addressing that. That's, that's got to be this thing. You've got to understand that. That that part of it, you've got to understand that he is moving based off of that love. Men, ladies, men, we want to be respected, then needed, then loved. And we want to respect, we need to be respected more than we need to be loved. Respect is the number one drive for a man. That's why when you go to Ephesians chapter 5, ones everybody misquotes and misuses, 5 and 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as even unto the Lord. Um, but what, 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 what most people, especially men who misquote that don't understand, this isn't a submission uh, uh, subjugation. This is a submission into the love. This is a submission into the guidance and the covering. He's trying to give you something and you're fighting back on it. This isn't saying you are the boss of me. This is saying I trust you to cover me. And see, man, if you're not willing to cover her, you can't expect the submission that this is intended to bring about. This isn't submission as in you're the boss of me. Tell me what to do. This is a submission that I will provide you with the respect you deserve when you cover me. And what does it say? If you if you don't get it, if you don't understand it, when it says, wives, well, submit to your husband, go down to the end of that passage, verse 33. See, that's verse uh, 22. Go to verse 33, and it tells you what? Husband loves your husband, love your wives, and wives what? Respect your husbands. It gives you the translation at the end. Respect. That's what we want. Respect. So, in essence, there's so much in this that we need to build, but we, we need to, again, create the capacity for the family. If we don't rescue the family, we're in a, we're in a world of hurt. The family, again, is the training ground for empowerment in the mind, training ground for values, interests, and principles, the training ground for expectations and the capacity to build wealth. The training ground for the power of self-esteem. Uh, I have this 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 concept called visionetics. It's what I built the Visionetics Institute on, and it comes from two people I have a lot of respect for: Guy Greenfield and Matthew Maltz. Uh, who Matthew Maltz is the father of psycho cybernetics. The idea that your self image is going to govern how you perform in life. If you don't deal with the self image, you can never change your trajectory. So you're going to project in your behavior what you believe you are. Visionetics is the idea of being able to see beyond what you see today to see better. But it's also, talk, I talk about label givers. Your prior parents are your primary label givers. They're going to be the greatest influence on your self-image. When you have both parents in the house, there's something that dad can do that mom can't do. Mom is a filler. Mom is intuitive. In, intuitive. She has intuition. Dad is a seer. Dad sees visions. Dad sees potential. Dad sees things that mom doesn't. Dad speaks it. Dad is a label giver just like mom. When you lose one of your label givers, you imbalance the scale on what is given in those labels. 
And you got to understand that those labels are being developed primarily in a single parent household from an effeminate dynamic, an effeminate position. So it's going to have an effeminate influence. And that is negative for both boys and girls, believe it or not. The balance of a young girl's identity is from dad. When she tends to get everything from an effeminate side, she becomes highly uh, adverse to the masculine energy of a man. And she'll fight back when it comes to the boy. If he doesn't have the masculine energy, the father, he, he doesn't have anything to emulate, first of all. And he doesn't have that part of him being nurtured by the energy and the direction and the attention of the father. There's so much that goes into this that's so, 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 so much deeper. But what we got to understand is if we don't do something to change this. If we don't get to a point to where we are literally creating programs and systems. Uh, I mean, black man lead is a start. Uh, Marion's restoring for ghettos gotten daughters is a start. The wraparound services that we offer are great, but they're flashing. Up. I mean, a small part of what's going on. There is three, there is almost, it's cl we're closing in on 50 million people in this country. And very few are in ideal situations. The family is under attack. We went from 75% of black children being born into two-parent households in 1960 to the absolute reverse now. Now, from what I understand, we are starting to make correction. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that, but that's small. And that's going to, you know, at the rate it's going, it's going to take forever. We need to rescue ourselves, meaning that we need to find a way to take kids who are born into single house households or living currently in single households and properly socialize them into the notion of creating families because the family is the source the structure it's what's coming from but when you even in extended family when the extended family is all from a broken structure there's all these fragmentations and no connectivity have you noticed that if all these single women are going on they hang out together maybe man bash the women the dudes are hanging out talking about the women woman bashing and woman blaming and nothing is ever, ever accomplished in that. You get one or two people come out of it, do exceptionally well. Everybody looks at them for handouts. Because the family wasn't structured right. When it's structured right, the family builds one layer on top of the other. And you, what you start to look at is now I'm not just passing down heritage and power. I'm passing down generational wealth. I'm passing down generational responsibility and expectation. I'm passing down all of the things that are going to result in an entire family at some point being on their A-game. Where everybody's got it going on. No more anomalies to explain. Everybody's got it, but you've got to build a structure that can support it. It's real simple. If you study it, it's real simple. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts, uh, but the idea is real simple. The concept is real simple. The actual play out is quite complicated, but the, the concept is this. When you have a whole family, you create whole people. When not, then you deal with all other kinds of consequences of not having things in place. Uh, my challenge is that we come together, that we start to see the importance of uniting. We start to see the importance of standing together and building families, that we give black women and black men who are single parents the support they need, but that we support programs that offer alternatives to single parents that says, hey, we will show you how to socialize. We will provide the environment for socialization. Black Man Lead is about bringing young black boys, starting at age four, into the presence of men to see how men operate, to see how men handle their responsibilities, to see how men handle stresses, how men handle difficulties and setbacks, but also to see how men function in their responsibility to be business owners, to be high earners, to be providers, protectors, uh, to be prophets, priests, all these different things that we need to be in our home. Before we ever step out and do anything in the community, we, 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 we've we got to be that in our home. And when you have a program like Black Man Lead, what we do is we bring that in. But uh, we also have to be taking care of our baby girls. We also have to provide an environment for them to show them who they are. Because let me tell you what's happening with our baby girls, which is really, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to end after this, which is really uh, concerning to me is that because we're not properly socializing them, because we're not giving them an anchor, and because dad is the true uh, 
source of identity. And I'm going to give you an example. With all of my girls, um, and I have eight, um, with all my girls, when they, start, when they get to the age of communication, when they get to the age where we can have just basic conversation, my girls, I pass by them. Hey, daddy. Hey, baby. Who's the most beautiful girl in the world? I am daddy. What can my baby do if she puts her mind to it? Anything. And what happened over time is it sunk. My oldest daughter will be 38 in a couple of months. Married 17 years now to the first. Next daughter, 32, something like that. Married 10 years to her first. The next one hasn't married yet. And the other ones are early 20s, teenager. But, and I'm not saying I'm a perfect dad. This isn't what this is about. This is about this one specific thing. The identity comes from the father, the identity. And you know what? You can't tell. I, I, I just got through communicating with the oldest one. She's on TikTok, social media. She's, you know, she's been like some married or whatever. But she's just having a ball and she's just basking. And you, you can't tell this kid she's not beautiful. Now, she's gorgeous by any stretch of the imagination, by anybody's standards. She's gorgeous. But it's more than that. It's the beauty that her spirit, man, whenever I'm feeling bad or ever I'm like, man, I screwed the whole dad thing. I called her and after I'm out, I'm like, I'm on cloud nine because this kid just does that. But again, I did it on the front end. I poured into her. I told her who she was. And I, I, I told her husband, you got my baby, so it ain't nothing I won't do to help you. So don't ever think you can't come to me. But this is what you got to do to my daughter for me to be okay with you. Look, let me tell you something. We have to do better. Because if we don't give our babies a clear identity, this is what's going to happen. And this is the point I want to make before I close. For the first time in history over the last eight, seven, seven, eight years, young black girls ages 5 to 13 are leading in uh, suicides, not attempts, in successful suicides. Five to 13, black girls are number one. Social media is playing a major role in that because what? The moment that they leave the house, you told them they were cute, but they're going out into a world where everything that doesn't look like them is being celebrated. And they are being made fun of. They are being bullied. They are being told what the Eurocentric idea of beauty is, what the Eurocentric. And the crazy thing is the very people that are pushing that stuff on them are doing everything in their power to look like them. But they don't know that. They can't process. They can't make sense of it. They just know how they feel because they don't fit in. We've got to anchor them in a socialization that's so powerful that they, when they step out into something that's the antithesis of what they've been told, it doesn't shake their foundation. It doesn't make them feel less than. It doesn't make them feel like they need to try to fit in or be accepted. They know who they are in and of themselves. That's our responsibility. Right now, we're failing at it. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. I, I, I just really want to get this series on the family off to a good start. And we're going to def definitely get into it. Um, like I said, for those who want to get this particular book, I'm going to put this one and the other link to this is the sequel, basically, to Born in Captivity, Psychopath, Knowledge as a Legacy of Slavery. This one is The Undoing of the African-American Mind, an, introductory, uh, an introduction to the collective bias reality syndrome. Um, and so this is, man, probably the most slept on of my books. But, man, I spent time and I'm like, man, I was in a zone, man. But that's my passion for my people and it will continue to be but again as i get ready to get off if you believe in the work that we're doing the research and everything else that went into it, being this book and then being able to bring it to you and being able to create programs to the programs themselves show some love and support and donate we have so many of our people 
with no resources, no access to help, mental health, uh, wraparound services, um, and, 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 and therapy. And, and We need to rescue the black family. I cannot stress that enough. We need to restore black love at a level that we are committed to loving one another in the way that we need to be loved so that we can project that upon our kids in ways that will empower them to go out into this world and not only compete but win. Uh, on that note, I'm out of here. I wish you guys the best. Uh, have an unbelievable remainder of, the, of your day and your weekend, and I'll talk to you soon. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.